Hello everyone and welcome to this Zoom talk. Today I'm going to be talking about Babylon or Mystery Babylon. Uh, to start this off, let's have a, a quick look at Revelation 17 verse 5. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Um, and let me just put up the next slide, which shows this same verse in the New American Standard Version. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now you will note, hopefully, that the NASV does not have mystery in capital letters and that it puts in the article a mystery. Just quickly back to the King James Version. Name was written Mystery Babylon the Great, NASV, A Mystery Babylon the Great. Now this difference perfectly exemplifies one of the major contentions over this verse. The King James Version and some others put the word mystery in capitals, thus making it part of the name. Others do not, thus making the word mystery descriptive that Babylon, etc., is the mystery, rather than the name of the harlot being mystery. Now this seemingly minor change can affect how you view this. As we shall see when we get to these chapters, some view this Babylon as a city, and that city with all it represents is a mystery. So it is hidden till God reveals it. Others see the mystery as being part of the title or name, and there are some, to be fair, who don't see it as part of the title, but say that it's much more than a city, that it represents a mystery that has been working on the earth for centuries. And thus what the angel is referring to is not a real city, or alternatively, it may be a real city, but that there is a mystery working that is separate or not dependent on a physical city named Babylon. So, is the woman the same as the city or are there two different entities is a question that some theologians have to ask. So the two main views are, is Babylon a mystery that runs throughout time or is it a city? And some in the middle think it's both. I hope I've summed that up without confusing you. It is a bit confusing, but it is pertinent to our understanding of Babylon. And this is our start point for today. But first, we must examine the history of Babylon in more detail to try and grasp this. Babylon as a city is mentioned more times in the Bible than any other city apart from Jerusalem. I counted it in my electronic Bible in the NIV and it came to 250 mentions. Babylon as a subject is not something you would tend to hear much about in most churches. Yet it occupies a very important place in the Bible, and especially in prophetic passages. As you know, I'm doing a teaching series through the book of Revelation, and two chapters in particular present issues in regard to Babylon, namely chapters 16 and 17. Now I decided that because Babylon was so important as a subject, then rather than trying to cram in important knowledge and history about Babylon into the studies on those two chapters that it actually deserved a separate talk. So here we are. In order to understand Babylon and its important place in scripture, we have to go back to its origin. And of course, that takes us back to Genesis. I think I always knew that in speaking about Revelation, I'd end up in Genesis one day. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 10 and we read chapter 10 verses 6 to 12. Here we go. The sons of Ham were Cush and Mizraim and Put and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba and Havilah and Sapta and Rama and Sapteca. And the sons of Rama were Sheba and Dedan. Now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Eric and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. From that land he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh and Rehoboth-ur and Kala. 
and resin between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. Bit of a city builder old uh, Nimrod, wasn't he? Now these four cities that are mentioned here in the land of Shinar, and that's Babel, Eric, Akkad and Kalna. Um, and Shinar is where we get the word Sumeria from. Uh, Wilbur Smith's Bible Dictionary uh, from Nashville, published by Thomas Nelson, says Shinar, and it's cited by uh, spirittruth.org. Shinar, the ancient name of the great alluvial tract through which the Tigris and Euphrates pass before reaching the sea. The tract known in later times as Chaldea or Babylonia. It was a plain country where brick had to be used for stone and slime for mortar. So that Shinar is the same as Samaria. Now this, let me show you a slide of ancient Samaria. Now here we, here we are. You can make out, hopefully, uh, Babylon and, uh, on the, the sort of mid left and hopefully further down you can make out Uruk uh, down there um, on the mid, uh, mid well, lower centre. Um, so that's essentially the Tigris Euphrates basin or the land of Samaria. And many of course see this as where uh, human civilization began. Of course secular historians dismiss the flood but for us it would make sense. They obviously migrated from Mount Ararat down into this area. It was a fertile area so that would make sense for them to do that. Now we will go to Genesis 11 shortly where we can see that the city was not completed and neither of course was the Tower of Babel. Uh, but the reason I say this now is because secular archaeology seems to generally put Babylon at a much later date. Um, so they don't have anything much to say about this original city other than to say, of course, that the tower was a myth, which is fairly par for the course as far as secular archaeology is concerned. Uh, Wikipedia, for example, says um, the Tower of Babel. Narrative in Genesis 11, 1 to 9 is an origin myth meant to explain why the world's people speak different languages. Well, it's a very good explanation why the people of the world speak de different languages, an explanation which they don't seem to be able to, to understand. And they don't seem to be able to come up with a very um, cogent alternative explanation, however, be that as it may. So they don't have much to say about the original Babylon. Once it starts getting to the era of Nebuchadnezzar and uh, Nebuchadnezzar, yeah, there's much more to say about it. But they do have something to say about this city called Eric. And they say that Eric is the same as the biblical Uruk. So if you look again at the picture, Uruk, in the middle, down towards the bottom, that's Uruk. And they say that that's Eric. Let me read this out from Wikipedia. In myth and literature, Uruk was the famous capital city of Gilgamesh, hero of the Epic of Gilgamesh. It is also believed that Uruk is the biblical Eric, Genesis 10.10, 10, the second city founded by Nimrod in Shinar. The word Uruk means city or town, according to some scholars. Encyclopedia Britannica says this, Eric, Sumerian Uruk, ancient Mesopotamian city located northwest of Ur, you can see Ur down there on the map, in southeastern Iraq, so all this is Iraq. The site has been excavated from 1928 onward by the German Oriental Society and the German Archaeological Institute. Erich was, or Uruk was one of the greatest cities of Sumer and was enclosed by brickwork walls about six miles or 10 kilometers in circumference, again from Wikipedia. In addition to being one of the first cities, Uruk was the main force of urbanization and state form formation during the Uruk period or Uruk expansion, which they put 4,000 to 3,200 BC. This period of 800 years saw a shift from small agricultural villages to a larger urban center with a full-time bureaucracy, military and stratified society. Although other settlements coexisted with Uruk, they were generally about 10 hectares, while Uruk was significantly larger and more complex. The Uruk period culture exported by Sumerian traders and colonists 
had an effect on all surrounding peoples who gradually evolved their own comparable competing economies and cultures. So this is just a bit from secular archaeology and history about what was what was going on. And bear that in mind, this is quite a substantial city, especially for the time. Um, what does it say? It's about six miles in circumference. That's a fair, fair size. It would take you most of a morning to walk around that. So Nimrod was a city builder. He was a kingdom builder. And this is the first mention in scripture of the word kingdom. Now you can't have a kingdom without a king. So it's clear he must have been the king. Many think that his name means to rebel. And he has been called the apostate of the patriarchal age. Now we next need to take into account scriptures in Genesis 9, 1 and 7. Genesis 9, 1. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Verse 7. And as for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. You know, particularly fill the earth. God wanted man to multiply and fill the earth. And most biblical scholars seem to suggest that that means to spread out across the earth, to keep moving. So what did mankind do? Well, they settled down and started to build cities. And they were big cities too. So this was an act of rebellion against this command in Genesis 9 one and that's why i read to you the bit from secular archaeology about these cities to show you that this was a very planned uh, movement by the people in those days you see once you have a kingdom and a king and you start building cities what you see is centralization rather than dispersion and once you have centralization you have a ruler you have a bureaucracy you end up with you end up with laws you end up with commerce and you end up with oppression, the oppression of money, the oppression of laws, etc., etc. All things, all sorts of things start to happen, which evil man can take advantage of. And this was not God's plan. It's interesting in these days that we see a large move back to cities. People migrate from the countryside to the cities. It's fascinating, isn't it? Now, Nimrod wasn't, of course, the first person to have built a city. We read in Genesis 4:17 that Cain did just that. And we know that Cain was a rebel against the Lord. God had said to him, you will be a restless wanderer. Cain's response to that was to build a city. So that presumably an act of rebellion. Human civilization became more and more corrupt. We know this. So God destroyed nearly all of it in the flood, apart from Noah, of course, and a few others of his family and the animals, etc. Nimrod Knowing all of this, knowing about the flood, must have known the causes of the flood. It would have been well talked about. So knowing all this, what does he do? Well, he sets out to rebel against the commandment of the Lord and build cities in opposition to God's instruction. This is overt, an overt act of rebellion. Joseph learned nothing from the flood. Nothing at all. None of the stories that were handed down to him, he wasn't listening and heard a thing. So one of the first points I want to make is that we can see that Babylon, or mystery Babylon, if you prefer, represents rebellion against God. Now we need to move on in the story. Genesis 11, 1 to 9. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in China and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they had begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth and they stopped building the city. This is why, that is why, sorry, it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world 
and there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. And I hope you didn't miss the note, the, the reference to the Trinity there in verse, verse 7. So after the flood, everyone has one language. They're migrating across the world. They come to the land of Shinar. They dwell there. And almost certainly under Nimrod's leadership, they start to build the city and the famous or infamous Tower of Babel. Now, everyone focuses on the tower. And of course, it is very important. But it's important we don't miss this bit about the building of the city. Its location was roughly about 50 miles south of what is now Baghdad. And though Nimrod isn't directly criticised by scripture, it's clear that this man was offending against God. He's in fact a forerunner or a type of the Antichrist. They wanted a city and a tower so that they might not be scattered. So here the rebellion against God, clearly outlined, they weren't going to do what God was telling them to do. No sorry, they were going to stay put right where they were. We like this bit of real estate, we're staying here and we're building a city. God said spread out the earth. Nimrod was behind this. It's unthinkable to me at least that the cities and kingdoms ascribed to him by scripture can mean anything other than he must have been behind this rebellion against God. He must have been the organizer, I think, the leader. So God comes down to see what they're doing and takes action by confusing their languages. Such an important passage of scripture, this Genesis, the seabed of the Bible. You see, this is mankind uniting against God. God's answer is to confuse their language, which would lead eventually, did lead eventually to nations coming into being. Because naturally, if everybody's speaking different languages, you're going to collect with people who speak your same languages, and gradually you're all going to migrate, you're all going to move to a certain area, and you're going to settle that, and then it becomes a nation state eventually. God scattered the people. And what they should have done by free will, in loving response to God's commandment and instruction, they were now forced to do. This clearly shows that God did not want a united humanity, certainly at this time. The reason being because of their behavior outlined here in Genesis after the flood, that once mankind gets together, it always leads to rebellion. Babylon itself represents rebellion, but the uniting of mankind also represents rebellion because God's, God's instruction was scatter, fill the earth. But what does man want to do? He wants to come together. When mankind unites, I say it's always in rebellion against God. And that's why I firmly believe in the nation state and why I personally am against internationalism. The cooperation between nations is good. It's all very well and good. But when the nation state itself starts to be undermined, you know that trouble is brewing. There is a push in these days from certain political movements to bring in some polit new political union or force which does away with the nation state. Indeed, it seeks to undermine it. I believe that the EU is one manifestation of this. You might disagree, that's fine, God bless you, but I believe that it is a manifestation of this because it ultimately seeks to dispense with the nation state. Now we see some movements in the West in particular just recently that seem to have within their DNA as it were a hatred for their own nation. People are cursing their own nation. They seem to want to bring their own nation down. I believe it's all part of the same attack on the nation state. Let me take, give you one example from a little, little, bit, a little bit ago. This is uh, from the Green Party, for example. This is a quote from their 1997 policy document. So it may well have changed, or they may have decided to delete it because it's a bit controversial. However, for the purposes of making my point about where some politics is leading, I want to include it here. And this is in their 1997 policy document, and the reference is NY300. And I quote, We will work to create a world of global interresponsibility in which the concept of a British national, in quotes, is irrelevant and outdated. And let me be clear again, because I don't want to slander the Green Party, this may well have changed, but it certainly revealed their thinking then. And I doubt that their thinking, that sort of thinking, has gone away. I think it's shared by many. This is an attack 
on the nation state. Now, I personally believe, you may disagree with me, that this is all part of the rebellion that stems from Babylon. Right, back to Babylon. Nimrod founded Babylon and he was a rebel against God. Evidently, Babel in the original language meant the gate of God or gateway to the gods, but in Hebrew means confusion. That's so typical, isn't it? Man wants to become God or to find new gods, thinking it will bring him success, but it always ends up in confusion. Right now, we have a new righteousness arising in the earth. It's a righteousness that is against the righteousness of God. Part of this righteousness is a kind of eclecticism that all things are allowable. The one thing you can't do, of course, is to state God's truth against these things. And it's resulting in confusion. If you look at the current controversy about transgenderism and people who are identifying as females, even though they are to all intents and purposes clearly male, i.e. They, they look male in build, they've got a penis, etc., and they want to use female toilets. And one can see from this the confusion that arises when we depart from the word of God. In the beginning, God made them male and female. It was his plan. And under natural circumstances, only male and female can join in union to multiply and fill the earth. Without some other sort of intervention, it can't do it. Nimrod was the leader of rebellion against God, and that manifested itself in building both the city and the tower. And this note, not long after the flood, which had just wiped out humanity. The one thing we learn from history is we never learn anything from history. He was making a name for himself. Setting up a kingdom was against God. And a very important part of this whole rebellion against God would be new idolatrous religion or religions. Gods, in other words, with a small g. Gods, with big g, God's immediate response to this would be to scatter people, but longer term to call Abraham and found a nation for himself that would be a witness in what would be increasingly a pagan world. So again, one of the key aspects of Babylon that we need to have some understanding of is that it was the primary source of false religion. And this fact has a great bearing on our understanding of Revelation 17 and 18 when we get there. Now, many think that the Tower of Babel was some kind of ziggurat. And although it seems that archaeology cannot pinpoint the Tower of Babel, for interesting reasons, other ziggurats have been found in the area which scholars believe were built after the pattern of the Tower of Babel. And perhaps the, well, the most well-known of this is the one at Bor Sippa, also called Burz Nimrud. The tower has seven stages, each of which it is suggested represented some of the planets, and at the top was a tower which contained signs of the zodiac. It also seems that a large part of the false religion emanating from Babylon was astrology. Many think that the wise men or magi were astrologers from the area of Babylon. Let's have a few, look at a few slides. This is a Wikipedia on Burz Nimrud, Borsippa, Sumeria. I'm not going to go through all that lot. Uh, or Burz Nimrod, having been identified with Nimrod, is an archaeological site in Babylon province, Iraq. The ziggurat is today one of the most vividly identifiable surviving ones, identified in the later Talmudic and Arabic culture with the Tower of Babel. And that's a picture today of, the, of this uh, ziggurat. There's not a lot left of it, obviously. And this is an extract from Answers in Genesis. The Tower of Babel has traditionally been depicted as a type of ziggurat, although the Bible doesn't give specific dimensions. The Hebrew word for tower used in Genesis 11, referring to the Tower of Babel, is migdal, a tower, by analogy, by analogy a rostrum, figuratively a pyramidal bed of flowers. Interestingly, this word means tower, but figuratively reflects a flower bed that yields a pyramidal shape. This gives a little support to the idea that the Tower of Babel may have been pyramidal or ziggurat shaped. A ziggurat, of course, is shaped. You've all seen pictures of the pyramids in Egypt. Uh, well, a ziggurat is roughly the same, but with, with, with steps down the side. So I'll continue with this quote. In what is now Iraq, Robert Calderway excavated a structure, something to be the foundation of the original Tower of Babel. It underlays a later ziggurat that was thought to be built by Hammurabi in the 19th century BC. Okay, that, the number at the end is just a quote. So, so let me just 
me just go back to uh, my notes. So a couple of things to bear in mind. One is that obviously we're looking at remains. So we shouldn't think the Tower of Babel looked like the picture we've just shown, but it does show this. It makes this point that ziggurats were common in the area. And in fact, of course, they're not uncommon in other parts of the world, in parts of South America, you come across ziggurats. And in part, I believe the Southeast Asia, you come across them. Now this building pattern would have had an origin. And I believe that origin was the Tower of Babel. Now, modern archaeologists associate this not with Nimrod, but with a local deity named Naboo. It shouldn't surprise us really that modern scholars don't want to recognize the biblical account. Anyone who's studied the Bible for any years, any, for any number of years, are well acquainted with archaeologists' consistent attack on the scriptures. Now, the other major religious or idolatrous idea that came out of Babel and or Babylon was the mother-child cult. And some suggest this was started by Semiramis, who might have been the wife of Nimrod. Others seem to put Semiramis at a later period, uh, but there does seem to be agreement, at least, to the fact that the mother-child cult started in Babylon. Now, the Reverend, the Reverend Alexander Hislop, in his book, The Two Babylons, which is a famous reference work for this kind of thing, says this, the Babylonians in their popular religion supremely worshipped a goddess mother and a son who was represented in pictures and images as a child in his mother's arms. And he goes on to say that in Egypt, we have the same theme in Isis, Osiris and Horus, that the mother-child religious concept and worship spread around the world, even into China, that pictures of mother and child are common as, as it relates to idolatry. Here's a few that I've just put up for you. Here's a drawing, a Babylonian drawing of the goddess mother Semiramis with her child Tanos in her arms. Here's a picture of an Egyptian mother and child. And here's a, a mother goddess and child. This is from the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, California. Okay. So the, the two Babylons is a, is a very good reference for this. Uh, of course, we're dealing with ancient things and getting to grip with them is like trying to get a grip on a puddle of oil, frankly. Um, you know, the more you research ancient archaeology, the more difficult it gets. In fact, it's a bit like walking into a pub and there's a brawl going on. And what you want to do really is back out as quietly and surreptitiously as you can and not get in the way, you know, because the archaeologists disagree. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. If we, we Even in this COVID-19 business that we've got, so many scientists disagree, don't they? You know, some say, oh, no, you should definitely lock down. Some say, no, you should try and go for herd immunity. Some say this, some say that. So it's no surprise that, that scientists disagree. It's extraordinary the, uh, the faith that humanity puts in science when it disagrees. And yet the Bible, written over centuries by many different authors, agrees in its entirety. But people don't seem to want to put faith in that. I wonder why. So the conclusion I draw from this is that mother and child theme is widely distributed around the earth, including in Roman Catholicism. This is a picture, the slide you're looking at now, of Madonna and child. And you'll note the similarity. Now, you know, I know that mums with babies in their arms are all going to look very similar, but it's extraordinary the number of pictures and idols there are like this. And there's no doubt in my mind, it's all started in Babylon. And in Revelation 17, 5, Babylon is called the mother of harlots. It's to do with idolatry. So next, that's the next key to Babylon or mystery Babylon. It's the root of false religion and idolatry. The concept of a goddess mother is very common and is often associated with a child. A noticeable theme, for example, in the book of Jeremiah is that of the Queen of Heaven. And this is quite possibly linked to certainly many people's minds with the mother-child religion. So many of these idols were female and connected with fertility for obvious reasons. There are five references uh, in, to the Queen of Heaven, all in the book of Jeremiah. I'll just quote this one. Jeremiah 7.19. The children gather wood, the fathers light the fire, and the women knead the dough and make cane, cakes of bread for the Queen of Heaven. They pour out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. 
And here's another little quote to give you some kind of background on this from Wikipedia. Queen of Heaven was a title given to a number of ancient sky goddesses worshipped throughout the ancient Mediterranean and Near East during ancient times. Goddesses known to have been referred to by the title including Inanna, Anat, Isis, Ishtar, Astarte and possibly, I would say definitely, Asherah by the prophet Jeremiah. In Greco-Roman times, Hera and Juno bore this title. It's also worth mentioning, I think, at this point, that often the worship of these goddesses would involve debauchery of some kind. And uh, certainly one writer I looked at said the religious system of Semiramis had many secret rites in the worship of its idols. These were called mysteries. That's interesting, isn't it? Secrets into which new members had to be initiated. When the initiates were initiated, they were given a cup containing a mysterious drink made of wine, honey, water and flour. This represented the doctrines of the cult, but it also made the participant intoxicated and prepared for what the participant was about to see, hear and do. And of course, even today, you've got secret societies with initiation ceremonies. Praise the Lord, but you don't have any initiation ceremonies. Even baptism in water isn't an initiation ceremony for the church, really. You can just join a church. You can just walk in. And even if you're a believer or non-believer, you can just walk into a church. Obviously, it's helpful if you're a believer, <laughs> then you know what they're talking about. But, you know, we're open. You can't just, there are many things like the Freemasons, you can't just walk in. I couldn't, I couldn't just walk into a Freemasons meeting and say, oh, I just want to turn up, see what's going on. No, you have to be initiated. You don't have to be initiated into the church. Hallelujah. Once you're born again, you're in the body of Christ, which is, which is good news. Uh, anyway, I digress. Um, Christianity.com has an interesting comment on the goddess Asherah. It says, and I quote, not to mention the Canaanite religion had quite a few immoral myths and practices. Asher, for instance, likely married her son after he supplanted El, reminiscent of an Oedipus, Oedipus Rex plot. There's another manifestation of the mother-child motif. You see, there's someone who says, suggests that Semiramis murdered Nimrod, then claimed that his child was Nimrod reincarnated in order to avoid being brought to justice over it. Now, maybe that's a myth. We don't know. But what's clear, and this is the point, the same pattern occurs over and over again. And if the same pattern's occurring over and over again, you know that something's around. You know, it's the old, it's the old phrase, isn't it? It looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. It's probably a duck. So this is about idolatry, and it roots back to Babylon. I'm not an ancient history scholar. And though when you look at things, things can be quite confusing in the detail, this overall pattern does emerge. And this common pattern continues to this very day. Asher was known as Queen of Heaven. Do we have a Queen of Heaven worshipped today? Many, including myself, would say that we do. Is it just a coincidence that the Virgin Mary is known as the Queen of Heaven by the Catholic Church? Let me put this up on Wikipedia. The belief in Mary as Queen of Heaven obtained the papal sanction of Pope Pius XII in his encyclical Ad Cali Reginam. I hope I pronounced the Latin right. If I am, forgive me, don't tweet about it. Um, English Queenship of Mary in Heaven. The coronation of the Virgin or coronation of Mary is a subject in Christian art, especially popular in Italy in the 13th to 15th centuries, but continuing in popularity until the 18th century and beyond. Christ, sometimes accompanied by God the Father and the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, places the crown on the head of Mary as Queen of Heaven. And there, there you have it. Many Christian writers and Bible scholars believe that the Roman Catholic Church is the present-day manifestation of the mystery religion of Babylon, having at its center the worship of the Queen of Heaven. They also see in many of the other doctrines and practices of that church, practices which can, according to many, be historically be related back to the Babylonian mystery religion. For example, purgatory. Uh, you can study that if you wish. You can 
you can find articles that are on it and you can read the two Babylons. I'm not going to go in more detail here, but it is an important point to bear in mind when we get to chapter 17, this relationship between Babylon and the Roman Catholic Church. And there are many who see the Roman Catholic Church as Babylon. Now they may or may not be right, but it is a very prevalent view. Some think that it actually runs wider than that, that includes many present day secular practices, such as the new age movement, astrology, etc. So they might suggest, for example, then that Babylon should be understood as a metaphor for religious mystery. You have to make your own mind up, but I want you to bear this in mind when we get to chapter 17 and 18. There's a common thread. I believe it has a common origin. I believe that's Babel or Babylon. And I think the Bible supports this in Revelation 17 and 18. So just to sum up for a moment, not quite at the end yet, sum up we have some threads associated with Babylon. Rebellion, the uniting of mankind, which ends up in rebellion against God, idolatry and false religion. These threads run through from ancient Babel right through to the present day. And some see that as the mystery. However, others, while they might agree with the threads, think that the mystery is the rebuilding of ancient Babylon once again, that Babylon will be rebuilt and will be a city during the tribulation. So a question we have to ask ourselves then is, will Babylon be rebuilt? And is there any biblical evidence for this? Let's begin by turning to Jeremiah chapter 50, verses 35 to 40. A sword against the Chaldeans, declares the Lord, and against the inhabitants of Babylon, and against their officials and their wise men. A sword against the oracle priests, and they will become fools. A sword against their mighty men, and they will be shattered. A sword against their horses, against their chariots, and against all the foreigners who are in the midst of them, and they will become women. A sword against the treasures, and they will be plundered. A drought on the waters, and they will be dried up, for it is a land of idols. They are mad over fearsome idols. Therefore the desert creatures will live there along with the jackals, the ostriches will also live in it, and it will never again be inhabited or dwelt in from generation to generation. As when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah with its neighbours, declares the Lord, no man will live there, nor will any son of man reside in it. Now notice this is a sword against the Chaldeans, and against the inhabitants of Babylon. And notice what God says, as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah with its neighbours, no man will live there, neither will any son of man reside in it. There's another scripture we need to look at about this destruction, and it's in Isaiah 13. And Babylon, verse 19, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, it will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation, nor will the Arab pitches tent there, nor will shepherds make their flocks lie down there. Um, I can hear you saying, well, surely this has happened to, to Babylon, hasn't it? So how can it be rebuilt when God says, it, you know, it's, it's completely destroyed? Well, we've got to take a bit of a pause here. Things aren't quite what they seem. This prophecy of Isaiah is headed up as an oracle concerning Babylon. This is the theme of this passage of scripture. And like other prophecies, it deals with events both that are near, I near the near near the prophet's day with you know uh, a reasonable amount of time, decades. Um, and what do we see when we read through it? If we read from verses 6 to 11, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore all hands will fall limp, and every man's heart will melt. They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will writhe like a woman in labour. They will look at one another in astonishment, their faces aflame. Verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming cruel with fury and a burning anger to make the land a desolation and he will exterminate its sinners from it for the, the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light the sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will not shed 
its light. Now the whole passage down to chapter 14 verse 22 is called an oracle concerning Babylon. So it all applies to Babylon. But if you read through it, you can see that not all of it applies in the near history of Babylon. This section we have just read applies to Babylon in a way that must still be future. Look at the language that it is talking about. This kind of language only occurs during the tribulation. It only occurs during the end days, the day of the Lord. The stars of heaven and their constellation will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises. The moon will not shed its light. This is uh, talking about the end times. This is talking about uh, the tribulation. This is this is what it's referred to uh, when we when we've been looking through Revelation. So when you look at Isaiah 13 and the history of Babylon, you can see that well, some of it has to apply in the end days. And history itself shows that there is not enough evidence that this total destruction of Babylon has occurred. When Babylon was taken by the Medes. It was not totally destroyed at all. So the day of the law part of Isaiah 13 can't refer to the takeover of the city by the Medes. Can't do. Because when you read Daniel, the change from Belshazzar to Darius, for example, seems to be virtually seamless. It was more a political takeover than anything. And one would think that something as monumental as the destruction of complete destruction of the city would have been recorded. But it just seems to carry on as normal. It's business as normal. When the Cyrus took the city, it was business as normal. Again, there was no great destruction. In fact, according to historians, he seems to have treated the city very well. Herodotus, for example, says half of the city was taken before the population knew anything about it. If you remember from previous Bible studies that Roger Price given and others, uh, Cyrus diverted the waters of the Euphrates and entered into it by the dried up channel. He took it by surprise. Again, when Alexander the Great took the city, there's no great report, of, there's no report of great destruction of the city as outlined in the prophets. It, it, when Trajan, the Roman, arrived in the city, the site was deserted. But again, that's not the same thing as is outlined by the prophets. In fact, it seems that the city had a gradual decline rather than a devastating end. There's evidence that shows that in the 12th century, Babylon had grown somewhat and there were several mosques there. The destruction announced by the prophets is sudden and devastating. It's for these reasons that many conclude that Babylon will have to be rebuilt and will become again a great commercial, political and religious center. Now, whether you think that's right or not, you, you know, this, 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 there is a lot of evidence to suggest that might well be the case. There are, on the other hand, many who think and argue that Rome will be the religious centre during the tribulation. Possibly the centre of politics too. Others say no, Rome will be the, the, the centre of religion and Babylon will be the political and commercial centre. Others think that Babylon will be rebuilt and will contain all three elements, religious, political and commercial. So remember we're dealing with prophecy here, so we're looking through a glass darkly, as it were. So themes are clear, but details can sometimes be difficult to pin down. And that's why sometimes I kind of might seem to hedge my bets a bit, because there's a famous phrase that says prophecy makes fools of us all. There's so many people who talk with certainty about biblical prophecy and end up it, it isn't right. We don't, we don't know. Let's be humble about biblical prophecy, please. What we do know about these three things, religion, commerce, and politics, and under politics, I would include military power because uh, military power is politics by another means, of course. It contains and sums up all worldly power. So that's what it's gonna be. Now, let, me, let me read this quote by A.J. Say, it's a great commentator on Revelation. I, I like this guy. And he wrote this 130 years ago. Remember that it's agglomeration of religious power, commercial power, political power. And I quote, in what indeed does the mightiest and farthest reaching power on earth now already center? A power which looms up in all lands, far above all individual or combined powers of church or state or caste or creed, 
What is it that today monopolizes nearly all legislation, dictates international treaties, governs the conferences of kings for the regulation of the balance of power, builds railways, cuts ships canals, sends forth steamer lines to the ends of the earth and winds electric wires across continents, under the seas and around the world, employs thousands of engineers, subsidizes the press, tells the state of the markets of the world yesterday that everyone may know how to move today and has a living organizations in every land and city interlinked with each other coming daily into closer and closer combination so that no great government under the sun can any longer move or act against her will or without her concurrence and consent think for a moment for there is such a power a power that is everywhere clamoring for a common code a common currency common weights and measures and which is not likely to be silenced or to stop till it is secured a common center on its own independent basis whence to dictate to all countries and to exercise its own peculiar rule on all the kings and nations of the earth that power is commerce the power of the ephah and the talent the power borne by the winged women of Zechariah 5, the one with her hand on the sea, the other with her hand on the land, the power which even in its present dismemberment is mightier than any pope, any throne, any government, or any one human power on the face of the globe. These are remarkable words written 130 years ago on the power of religion, politics, and commerce. Uh, extraordinary. This is in a day long before the multinational corporations that we have today, the dominance of the likes of Google or Amazon or Apple. 130 or more years ago, this guy was saying this. It's extraordinary. How could he be so accurate? I'll tell you how I think he was giving it. Because he was a Bible believer who understood the scriptures and who knew from the scriptures what must be the Christians who study the word and who look at prophecy will have a way better idea of what's going on in the world than Christians who think, oh, I don't need to bother with prophecy. Half the time they have no clue what is going on. And yet this man, 130 years ago, could be so accurate. Oh, praise God for such wonderful Bible-believing Christians. I wish we had many more of them. So anyway, that's my little rant for the day. In the tribulation, all three of these great powers of religion, politics and commerce will fall under the remit of the Antichrist. The story of Babylon runs right through the scriptures. It's a story so big that I think it would take many hours of study to cover it properly. There are many who say that Babylon will be rebuilt, will be the headquarters of the Antichrist and will combine all three major sources of power in our world. I don't know, maybe it will. It's certainly a good thought. Maybe, maybe, well, that's something we might look at a bit more when we get to chapter 17 and 18. So all of this is just background, really, to help us understand a bit better the details and various arguments that we will encounter when we get to Revelation 17 and 18. And I hope you join me later on as we study these chapters in details. The next talk in the series will be on Revelation chapter 16. That's a great chapter. Please pray for me as I undertake these studies into this great, mighty, massive theme of the end times as spoken about in the book of Revelation. I really do need your prayers, beloved. God bless you and thank you so much for listening.